She said she can text. She said she can text. She can text. She can text. Okay. Cool, cool. All right, then. So Dr. Ridley and then Teresa and then myself. Um, we'll go in order and five minutes each. Darn, what happened? I will um I will time and tell you when you're down to one minute. And we're gonna start with number one, Dr. Ridley. Share, and you did send us an email. And if the answer is just read my email, then that's cool. But anything you want to say <laughs> about about um <laughs> based on your experience, your best practices. Mm -hmm. Five minutes. Let me get the thing going. Okay. Um, as I, I I I was exploring earlier, um, and again, yes, I can augment my email. Um, best practices has been for me um is really deconstructing the symbolism that is inherent in the so-called DEI work. Um, when we talk about decolonizing institutions, um, it, we have to be careful not to use the same models um, with, what is it, new wine and old wineskins? So uh, I'm very active in, in a global, quote unquote, intercultural uh, group. And one of the things I find is there is a tendency towards just changing the words and the language, um, which ends up being just a symbolic effort. And then we're surprised when we don't have um, new results. And so we focus a lot. Uh, our best practices are to start at ground zero, um, actually defining mythology, um, understanding what superstition is. Because if you're talking about um, racism and systemic racism at that, where it's built into institutions, if you're talking about eugenics, which completely and totally penetrates the school system, the educational structures in America, which influenced Europe, are built on eugenics. And so we have to deconstruct all of that. So we spend a lot of time doing that. So uh, coming back full circle, I wasn't real clear on just how much time you would have in the triennial um, regarding how you're going to be teaching. Uh, George, you have a fantastic um, book list uh, for um, developing anti-racist thinking um, with people who classify themselves as white. Um, but they're not but. And there is a tremendous amount of marginalized reading that these people have to do and even we have to do. So I, we try to uh, marry all of that. Um, you've heard me talk about my papers and the scholarship and the research uh, because ignorance is not bliss. And so we spend a lot of time educating people. And I'm talking about educating so-called professionals who are you know, from doctorate level to MD level, who think they have the answer, but yet we still end up, for instance, with health disparities. Why is that? We still end up with Black people being treated the worst, no matter where you go in the world. And we actually have research that um, sustains that, that talks about, uh, I'm talking about from white institutions that admit that Black people are treated worse worldwide. And so we keep coming back, we, meaning my my firm and the people I work with, we keep coming back to having to re-educate, um, reintroduce that racism is simply a superstition. Albert Einstein even said, racism is a disease of white people and I do not intend to be quiet about it. That's a quote from Albert Einstein. Um, but that kind of information is not widely circulated. They, people don't know Albert Einstein said that. Um, so uh, when we talk about so-called racial differences, religious differences, so, there's so much that is manufactured. And then we end up trying to band-aid on top of that rather than deconstructing all of that. Because we all know race is just a social construct. And so... Uh, going back to your question, George, we find best practices are we have to systematically deconstruct what the assumptions are going in and then rebuild what our knowledge should be. 
And I don't think you have a lot the time for that at the triennial, but you know, I'm curious. Oh Lord, no. <laughs> I'm curious as to how we might, you know, touch on some of that to yes. make to make your program effective. Thank you. And I will share as much as I can to address your questions when I share my experience and best practices. But Teresa? Oh, thank you. Five minutes is a very long time, as we can see. Yeah. Uh, but and I'll try not to take all of that time uh, because my background and experience is uh, with uh, working in settings uh, with white women uh, from the telephone company in 1966 to all of the organizations and unions I've been in. So I have developed some theory and practice or praxis as one would say, around doing uh, dismantling white supremacy uh, inside of organizational structures. And Will is not new to me. I have been in Will, as Shilpa Jane said, uh, based on having started in the 80s, I have an experience with starts and stops expanding over 40 years, and that's true. Uh, and so my main experience with a branch uh, is the Triangle branch, uh, which George, you know them well, mm -hmm. is an it was an all white branch until the Black Liberation Caucus intervened and began recruiting black women. I was close to the branch for years and didn't realize I was just a guest. They invited me to speak about anti-racism and the Southern Anti-Racism Network constantly, constantly. Uh, and I thought I was part of the branch because they charge uh, members $25 a month, uh, but it's to get the newsletter. And I didn't learn until from 1998 until 2010 that I was never really a member of the White Triangle branch. And they didn't think anything of it uh, because they worked very closely with the NAACP. They're in all the leadership bodies of the uh, Chapel Hill Carborough in AACP, George, uh, those white women take on major roles in black organizations, but they have never reciprocated. There are no black people in any real roles inside of the triangle branch of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So I do know Will, and Will, for its 109 years has been institutionally racist. So when Jane Adams was friends with Ida B. Wells and she thought, what are these black people doing to make them lynch them? And Ida B. Wells kept trying to explain to Jane Adams, the so-called founder of Will, uh, that <laughs> black people aren't doing anything to get lynched. It's the white supremacist that's just lynching. And Ida B. Wells hung in there with Jane Adams, uh, much to her credit. Uh, but that's the history of Will. And because I am a socialist, I believe in historical materialism. And so I do believe uh, that what George is planning to do uh, has limits. And I watched George do this process uh, with a small company uh, led by white women who had no intention of DEI or inclusion. And I watched all the black folks quit and et cetera. And George did that process for months and she was paid. It's a gig I gave George. And George, I'm telling this because I do want uh, everyone on the team to understand uh, you and I know each other well. 
and we've been working together for a long time, and we're going to continue to work together for a long time. And I'd like to see um, your experience, uh, this new experience, uh, because see, George has only worked uh, in white organizations as a staff person. George doesn't have a circle of black women friends like I would assume uh, Kim and you, Dr. Linda. I know my circle of black women friends is pretty huge. Uh, and so, but George doesn't have that in her life. Her relationships and her close friendships are primarily with women of European descent. I think I'm probably George, uh, George's closest black sister friend. Uh, and so I know that the limits of her experiences uh, will uh, show uh, when some of the black women uh, that we've been recruiting over these three years encounter some of the white fragility uh, that is definitely <laughs> going to show itself. Uh, in the 80s, we had a phrase that we used for it, uh, which was called white liberal racism. Uh, uh, and I've, I've used it up until uh, that woman came up with her book on white fragility. And now it has a name uh, that I think we can use to describe what we're going to be experiencing uh, as we go through this process in will. Because they love to read books, but the only way you can do anti-racism work is you got to be doing it in collaboration with inclusion. So if you have a branch that's all white, you'll never be able to do anti-racism work. So our goal in the BLC three-year strategy is that every branch would have at least three BIPOC members. That's our goal. And so at the end of this year, we'll see how close we are to that goal on at least five branches. And that's uh, what uh, needs to happen, George. Uh, and so my best practices come out of the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond, where they have a European Descent Allies Caucus, which is what we created here. And I say we will get the women that we are closest with to make sure that the other women uh, don't go crazy on us. That's, that's what I think is what we have to do in this process, because I do know, Will, I do know, what I've known many of these women for years. Uh, so I do understand what the problems are going to be that we'll encounter. Thank you, George. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> That was uh, almost eight minutes, so you may feel well, like- why did you stop me, George? You I'm not, because me. Kim's not here, so we had her time, and I want to get as much good information as I can, and you may have answered one of the other questions, which would ultimately save time. Well, George, one hour meeting. Let's okay, if meeting you got to leave, you got to leave. So oh, no, next- I, I, I will not leave, George. I don't have to leave. But I think after an hour, things just start to be, get. No problem. Okay. I hear you. Certainly. Yeah. So now Thanks. we're going to do another. Oh, my turn for my um, best practices as an anti-racist trainer. Um, most of my work comes from experience, not doing a lot of research or education around it, other than organizing with in a rural county in seven rural counties in North Carolina for years with mostly African-American and then white and then indigenous peoples and knowing we had to deal with the reality of racism. And at this point, we're, I, we were talking about personal racism, individual racism, the in some ways the least heinous of all forms of racism. And then we started working with Charlotte organization, what were they, Grassroots Something Project with SciCon, you might remember SciCon, Teresa, and um, Tema worked there, Tema Oaken, and Ken Jones, and they started 
putting together and we helped with dismantling racism workshops. And it did begin with dealing with the situations we were dealing with with Piedmont Peace Project. Um, there was heterosexism and racism and homophobia. And it was based on how the members, we were working on economic issues, jobs going to Mexico, um, people being treated badly at work, very sim simple. One community in one county that was surrounded by white people but had no public anything it was crazy. And um, see where my time is. And um, we would find that building the alliances to win, because you've got to have a broad group to win on anything, even if it's just putting up a stop sign. We had to deal with uh, the racism and the inter biases of people, but with Grassroots Institute or Grassroots, whatever they were called, um, and Tema and Kenneth and Sai and some of our staff, we started to see the institutional racism that the kind that you're talking about, Dr. Ridley. And a lot of what I would describe as my best practice is in the document, three page document I sent y'all mm -hmm. because, um, and what will be included, Dr. Ridley, in the first of two nights, Thursday and Friday, an hour to 90 minute each session. So not more than 90 minutes, so you can't do much. And mm -hmm. the intention is for the first night, I don't know the exact content. I hope y'all help me identify that, but it's about the basics, which means we got to plant some healthy thoughts in these people. First, we got to pull out the roots that are poison. We have to identify, here's the roots that are poisoning you. Now, this is based on my own experience. So there's part, part of it that may not be a fit at all for what we want to do with this group of women. And then, you know, you pull out the roots and you start trying to make some sense of the soil before you plant some good ideas. And a lot of that is around the definitions of racism and oppression. And some white people just lose their mind when you say every white person who breathes air is racist, period. Yeah, they, the lose they lose their mind. Pardon? They lose, they do. They lose I their mind. I had a, a Latino man in Arizona one time get mad at me because I told him he couldn't be racist because he was Latino. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can be prejudiced, bro, all day. But you can't keep somebody from having a job take their house away and be okay with it, break laws and be exonerated without any kind of accountability. Okay. I'm that's sure. right. So that's some of the basics that would happen on that first night. Here are the definitions. Deal. You need to do what you need to do and your branch needs to do what it needs to do to get comfortable being uncomfortable. It is not the work of people of color to take care of you. Even through this process, ain't nobody gonna hold your hand except your teammate and the other white people in your branch. Because the work, just as Einstein said, the work is white people's work. It's not our work. We do have work because racism is internalized and we have mm -hmm. to identify how it manifests itself just the way they have to identify how white privilege and other privilege manifests itself in your daily life and re remove that shit. So that's easy. I mean, not simple and easy but it's sort of a daily thing how, how in what way today so one of the questions i've asked people i have a minute left one of the questions i've asked people in um training you know if you don't get anything else identify how is privilege showing up and what can i do to eliminate it every day every yeah. day you mm -hmm. can't just do that step shit by reading a book or going to a movie or having an epiphany once or twice in your lifetime, it is a practice, which means you practice every day if you want to be real mm -hmm. and good. That's pretty much the first night. The second night is about planning. And, you know, starting with, okay, what do you see for your branch? Now, okay, I'll answer the rest of that when we do expectations, because my time, she is up. Awesome. Okay, I'm sharing the sc uh, screen. So now we do the second piece, missteps, gaps, or concern that you learned in your work. 
Dr. Ridley, can you give us some time on that? Five I'm sorry. minutes. That's awesome. Missteps, oh, gaps. Missteps and gaps. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, well, um, you know, Teresa said earlier, you know, you, you, you have different approaches with audiences. Maybe uh, when you're dealing with people who classify themselves as white, as white like you say, you've got to deconstruct and get them to recognize privilege. But one of the uh, missteps that I find, unfortunately, is oftentimes, and you, I think you alluded to that, George, people of color, Black people, don't want to have the conversation or don't want to go but so far. And so there might be some obstacles there where you, there may some need to be some education even there. So that I, I find those to be, um, and I'm not sure the word is missteps as much as you, you got to clear out, clear out that underbrush so everybody's on the same page before we go forward trying to make change. And we cannot make assumptions that just because uh, we're kinfolk that we're skinfolk. Is that how you say it? Um, and so just we because we're skinfolk. Don't mean we're kinfolk. Kinfolk. <laughs> um, I had it, but um, so that I mean, I, if you want to call that a misstep, it, it, I find that you you got to make sure that everybody's clear about that. Why do I say that? Because we live in an environment that, that is incredibly pressurized to conform. And so we're concerned about our jobs. Uh, we want we don't want to talk too loud. Uh, we don't want to upset too many people. And depending on what our obligations are, we don't want to step on any toes. And so, it, it, if it, when we take a step back, when we take a thirty thousand foot uh, view of our situation, there's absolutely no reason why black people are in the situation that they're in if we were to, to stick together. And looking at the economy, how much we bring to the economy, uh, how much we consume, how much we spend, you know, any approach you take, uh, how much creativity and innovation we bring to business and the arts and culture, it's it, it, it boggles the mind. And so when we come all the way back down to so-called missteps in terms of implementation, in my opinion, you know, I find that we get in our own way sometimes. That's the best way I can say it. Thank you so much. Teresa, can you respond to that thought of what are missteps and gaps in your experience around this work or concerns, missteps, gaps, or concerns? You there, Teresa? Might be trying to turn the radio off. Okay. Um, okay, I'll go. Let me set the timer. Um, so some of the missteps in in my work in the same category that you were describing there, Dr. Linda, early on, at least one of these things was early on, but um I was working with a young new organizer in the Piedmont Peace Project work that I was talking about before, same area, just years down the road. And still through working with the group with Psy and whatnot, one of their staff people who I won't name because that wouldn't be cool, uh, a person who appeared as a, a groovy black man, that's what people would call him, who was a good potential organizer, great public speaker, all that stuff. But part of his analysis, because I don't know if we'll be able to give these women any excellent, useful analysis, although you do have to have a theory of change. And that will probably be one of the starters on the second night for planning is like, so what's your theory of change? So one of the things that one of the I don't know what it is when you say something over and over again, not a mantra because it was not a healthy thing that this person had in his analysis, which at that time in the world, Teresa, 1996, 97, um, Ron Chisholm at People's Institute, which is awesome indeed, but Ron, part of Ron's analysis at that time, I don't think they use the same analysis now, 
but was very male focused. You know, the black man has been, you know, every other sentence beginning with the black man. It was a lot, a lot for me to hear. And um, this staff person had convinced this young woman that part of her responsibility as a black woman was to sexually satisfy this. I didn't cuss, breathe, breathe, breathe. Um, and it was bad because she was in many ways my responsibility. I was mentoring her and whatnot. And, um, I'd done work around sexual assault and domestic violence. So I knew a little bit about what to say, but it was just hard. And that was on me. That felt like my big misstep as a whatever the heck I was supposed to be. Um, okay. I got two and a half minutes left, Teresa. Um, I, um, another misstep, which isn't anything I can physically do a lot about, but I do take steps to erase this vision and of in white people's minds when I'm doing this work with them in person. I don't know if it'll be the same online, but being fat and black and Southern, there's this myth, Dr. Ridley, that this person is here to take care of me. And <laughs> there were, right? It was just so scary. It's Mammy. Uh, oh, look, it's Mammy. Um, and I took radical steps to just on the other side of not being hostile with people around my personal space and time alone during breaks. I did not hang out with people because I ain't trying to hear what you got to say. So it did push my um, introverted personality, more introverted, which now has probably turned into me being the weird old lady, but I don't care. I have no care for it now. Okay, so that hour, one minute and 15 seconds. Um, and another misstep, maybe my last one, I hope that I will make in life in doing this work is not remembering that an organizer is to help people get to the place where they do not need you or in the organizing I did or felt like I did. And one, there was a woman, Mona Jones, the Mona Jones, she was awesome. We were working in that same county where people didn't have plumbing um, or ambulance services. This woman watched her sister die on the front porch and the damn ambulance wouldn't come. But Mona was a woman who was working on a uh, project that involved jobs going to Mexico. And they had gone to the Proctor Silex board meeting and done all kinds of great stuff. And she was a great speaker. But her husband was one of the people that worked at the place that got shut down. And so part of my gaps is not, is not having a healthy experience with black men, I think. But anyway, every time Mona went home, I drove her home one day, one night after a meeting. And I found out every time she would come home from these meetings, she would get a beating. And she said it like, when you're a kid and you know if you go break the windows in the car, you're going to get a beating. This is in the late, nine, mid to late 90s, maybe 97, 98. And we were going to, we, the organization and those women particularly were going to be interviewed for CBS News mm -hmm. the next day. And I'm mm -hmm. driving her home. And I think actually this is a good story in the end because I think she learned the lesson. I don't know. But anyway, I'm driving her home. She's telling me this. And just as I would do when I went to court with women who had been raped, I kind of find a way to feel my heart but not start crying because I can't do that. You have to whatever, you know. So I'm and I tell her as I'm pulling up to her trailer that, you know, Mona, you don't have to come tomorrow if you don't want to come, thinking it would protect her from a beating. And I can't remember what, what all else I said, but she looked at me and she said, this is mine. Nobody's going to take this from me. It was awesome. But I realized, what the hell, George, who the hell do you think you are? And that is a lesson in many ways, because that's what white people sometimes do to us. And it is not okay. All right. I went 24 seconds over. I apologize. Okay. Thank you. One more question. I'm looking at our time and seeing. Oh, well, George. It's your turn. Uh, I'm sorry, Teresa. Yeah, when you called on me, 
uh, see, I moved so slowly and I had put the phone one place while I was moving in another place. So it took me a little while to get to it. Uh, but I see we've lost Kim. Yeah. Uh, but George, uh, this is my concern about your leadership on this uh, because you do approach it from an emotional lens. And so when you get in meetings with white people, uh, you start preaching to them and talking to them about what they should be doing, et cetera. But when you examine your work, you have been sitting as a lone black person in white institutions and formations and you never challenge them, like your employer with United for Peace and Justice. Uh, um, I think that our authenticity uh, to do this work has to be with the honesty uh, that we are learning to be better. Now, for me, uh, I'm known for pulling out the gas propelled flamethrower uh, because I have a low tolerance for the kind of stuff that's going on right now with that woman, Shilpa Jane, <laughs> who has no cultural competency whatsoever to be relating to women like me, but yet she's interviewing people through her eyes. And so that's why I wanted that meeting recorded, George. Uh, because for 90 minutes, she was looking at me like I was some kind of, as I said, lab rat. And she took issue with the lab rat reference. And I know it made Jenny Alden take a few days off. She's so frustrated with uh, uh, what's going on. And she said, I'd rather talk rather than use email. And I sent her a request to talk. Two or three days ago, I'm still waiting. She now has taken the day off, uh, three days off, and she'll be back on Monday. And so the email that I sent to Shilpa Jane telling her she's done. See, that is who I am. I will speak honestly and frankly with these folks because I am nonviolent, but I'm not a pacifist. And I am going to challenge the institutional racism in will. And until we do it head on, we're not getting anywhere. So George, you avoided doing this job, which really should have started in 2022. So here we are two years later with about nine months left in a three year strategic plan and we're just getting started. Well, George, I've been pretty angry about this, but it is what it is. So let's see what we can accomplish because we have some clear goals and strategic objectives because Teresa Elamine plans her work and works her plan. So at the end of 2024, when we're going into the Wilf International Triennial Congress, we will be assessing what the Black Liberation Caucus three-year strategy has been able to accomplish because the work we're doing now is just a component of that three-year strategy. So let's not lose sight of that fact because organizing the BLC and organizing the European Descent Allies Caucus was strategic. When they attacked the BLC, saying we couldn't have a caucus, I said, let's see what they'll say if the Europeans get a caucus. And as we know, not a word. So now we're working together. So that's how I do this work. I have learned years ago, and, and on the question of Black liberation and Black nationalism, I take a beating, Dr. Linda, because everybody's always saying to me on the Black side, why are you working with all those white people? And I said, because we can't win without them. 
you know, you in a town uh, where it's majority black and the city council got seven seats white and only three seats black. So don't be asking working with all the white people because they're the only people to work with because you have allowed them to do this for nearly 200 years. So I just want to be real clear, George. I know you. I know your work. I know what you've been able to accomplish. And when it comes to transforming uh, white supremacist structures, I want you to tell me which ones you have transformed because I've been watching you in that UFPJ thing uh, for years now, and it's a lily white situation. So George, let's be at least honest in all your stories uh, that are emotional and all of that, George, that's not what we need from you in this thing with these folks who see us as illegitimate in terms of the Black Liberation Talk. We've been fighting that for really three years uh, because in 2021. You're at six uh, when, minutes, Teresa. Well, yeah, and I need to say what I need to say, okay? Uh, because I don't want you to be dishonest. We will have accountability, consistency, and transparency. So, George, I will say to this team what I know about you and what you have been able to accomplish. And if I'm wrong and if I'm lying, please tell Dr. Linda. And this is being recorded, and I understand it's being recorded, and I trust you will share it with the other members of the team, Sheila and um. Uh, Kim, because I love you, George, but I know what your limitations are. And so for this process, in order not to mess it up in these last eight months of a three-year strategic plan, uh, it's got to be some real serious work, and it cannot be done emotional. I'm all about theory and practice. So putting the theory and the actual practice together to do what we call praxis. P-R-A-X-I-S. That's my training. Thank you. Awesome. And most of what you said will be part of our thinking together about content. You know, what is the content we want to include? And hopefully you can help with that. And yes, I by myself have not transformed an institutional organization. As I've told you many times, I do not believe one does this work by themselves. And I had did fail on the strategy chart to not pull together stuff and make it happen. But I am blessed now. Dr. Ridley, Kim, Sheila, you, we we will we will prevail. Um so we don't have a lot of time left. The two things I want us to do before we leave at eight, or not much after, is to identify the kind of resources needed for us to do this work. As I forwarded you an email, you may have not seen it yet, Dr. Ridley from Darien. She and I spoke this morning briefly. I think I may have woken her up, I'm not sure. And then um, I let her know, not just to put this on the agenda, you know, the training and the work for branches, but to expect a financial request. And um, so in terms of resources, I don't I don't want it to be limited just to what are financial, but we have to think about and may not be able to, um, you know, figure it out. Right. It's certainly not on this call, not ending on time. So after talking about that, you go, Dr. Ridley, Teresa, go. I see your hand, Teresa. I'm almost done. So answer that about resources and set a time for us to meet again, because we can't cover everything. And I don't want us to be rushed because it's too important to rush. Go uh, ahead, George. Uh, let me go first. You've been letting Dr. Ridley go first every time. Uh, so I want to go first to simply say uh, that it's about working together and that is organizing together. What Dr. Ridley is going to be doing, hopefully, is working with a bunch of white women in New York and bringing in more Black women to restart the New York City branch. See, fundamentally what the problem is, George, is that you're in a branch that's not functioning 
as a branch. And until branches function with the inclusion of people of color, there will be no praxis. So we can read books and talk stuff all day long, but until you're actually working together in the communities where you live as a branch, which is why we talked about this in terms of branches. And so it is my strategic thinking that went into this process of coming up with the anti-racism transformation. And I don't want to be disrespected uh, because I do understand that it is about organizing, George. And you have not done that organizing, George. But we must encourage the branches who do do organizing because they're active and they go out and do demonstrations and everything, and they do it as all white elderly women. We want that to stop. That's what we're doing. What is the look of wealth publicly? We want it to be a look of inclusion. So when you go to demonstrate against nuclear weapons, you got to make sure you have Black members there with you. That is fundamentally what needs to change. So it ain't no books or resources or anything that's going to do that for them. They have to develop a practice of engaging and recruiting uh, women of color. And that's just the bottom line for me. And that's how I'll be talking to them. So in terms of going into the branches, because what you haven't said to people, George, is that the accountability is to people of color. So the team that you're putting together, people of European descent have to be accountable to Black people. And so in the greater Philadelphia branch, that means Sheila, uh, but she clearly is not getting far as a single person because they just out isolate her. So it's my hope that Linda will join uh, uh, um, Sheila for the accountability sessions since New York is not that far from Philly. So who would you get to in the accountability sessions in Sacramento? And I say, we'd have to reach out to a different organization. And the people I know in that area a part of something called Catalyst. So we have to have some partners uh, in the California area uh, that are not will. And the organization I highly recommend is Catalyst. Uh, and so we can talk about that more in terms of resources. So the resources are actual organizations uh, that are doing this work that will be willing to come into will to assist. It's not about books. It's about real people who do this work. Tema Oaken, we can, I don't know if she's still doing this work, uh, but she took a break. And I do know all those people you talk about, Sai Khan, rest his soul. I do believe he passed away uh, quite a few years ago, but I knew all of them at Grass, uh, Grassroots Leadership Institute. I knew all those folks that you were talking about. And the Black guy, uh, who was their primary organizer who's still out in S South Carolina, I think. So, George, I do know the people in the South that you work with, uh, and so I do want us to be completely transparent mm -hmm. about how we get from where we are now to where we're supposed to be. Thank you. Um. Dr. Linda, is anything you want to share before we set a date to meet again? Uh, no, this has been very enlightening. Thank you very much. So can we meet in two or three weeks? Or, oh yeah, I think I asked y'all, the week before the Congress. Um, okay. I'm going to look at a calendar. I think that's the week of the 20, let me think, 24th. No, the twentieth. Yeah, that sounds like my final exam periods. Um, oh, lovely. Yeah, I'll try my best. Um, um well, maybe the week before well, then, George, which is only a week from now. Uh, George, strategically, uh, mm -hmm. we have the May seventeenth meeting. 
which is next week. So you and I can talk about how that will impact this process uh, because that's a joint meeting between BLC and EDAC and most of the EDAC folks are the branches that are part of this system uh, of, of, of what we're trying to do. So strategically, you can't just talk about us meeting in a week or uh, three weeks or whenever as a team without taking into account the EDAC component. So uh, May 17th is actually our next meeting and it's a Friday. And so we wanna make sure uh, that we're all clear that all of us need to be at that meeting in a week with the EDAC people who are chomping at the bit to be at that meeting to talk about what's going on with Shilpa Jane. So we got to get prepared for that. So you can't dismiss that uh, because this is being done in a context and in an environment that is problematic. And Darian can accuse me of being toxic all day long, which is what she did today uh, in a meeting about the Fannie Lou Hamer branch over email. So George, there's a lot going on that impacts what we will be able to accomplish because it's not being done in a vacuum. And You're right. The, it's not being done in a vacuum. But the in the... is May 17th. What time does that meeting start, George? I'd have to look at my calendar, but I'd need to say that the content of those two nights, the hour and hour and a half sessions, and I said at the beginning of this meeting, the first night is about the fundamentals. Um, Dr. Ridley named them as the myths uh, and making sure we are ripping out the roots and letting people know here's what the path looks like for the rest of your life. Most of that, that's that first hour to hour and a half. Second hour and hour and a half is about planning. You just described uh, something that is very specific to the experience with Shilpa Jane, which is important, which will not be ignored and will certainly be covered on the 17th. But the content, the content for what we do during that training of trainers is not in the hands of EDAC and BLC. It's in the hands of this team of just Black women. So we need to get together to say what that looks like. I guess we could do it by email, but it would be nice to talk. Oh, oh, Dr. No, Ridley, no. what do you say? It Sorry? has to be in person, uh, George. It has uh -huh. to be what? In person. Deciding I mean, what we're going to have as content has to be in person? I I mean, over Zoom, George, not email is what I'm saying. Okay, okay. Do you agree, Dr. Ridley? Oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, my, if my that's counter... a fact, then we have to meet before the Congress to decide on the content. We can propose something. I can propose something, but I know it's missing. I don't have the kind of... Um... George, what is, what is the date when you want to meet? That's all. Because uh, you know how flexible I am, and the Congress starts on the 29th. So today. What do you say, Dr. Fridley? You got exams and whatnot? You, you said you want to meet before the 17th or after? No, no, no. no. Anytime. No. Anytime before the 26th. Anytime before the 26th. You'll have to bear with me just a moment. Keeping in mind the evenings of the 21st and the 23rd and the 16th are out for me. Uh, and the 20th uh, is out. And the 19th at five o'clock is out. Uh, but I'm available uh, on the 24th. Uh, let's, do the, let's do the 24th. At seven o'clock. Yeah, so that can come. 24th at seven. Okay. It's a, yeah, it's a Friday. Okay, thank you. That we're set then. We're good. Thank you so, so much for coming and sharing your brilliant gems of wisdom. I will listen to the recording a lot. I will make sure it's shared with Kim and uh, Sheila. And well, I'll, probably talk to you. 
Uh, send it to all of us, George, uh, because I love listening and seeing how uh, bad I was or whatever. Uh, so uh, please send the recording to all of us so we yes. can hear the dynamics in the meeting. Uh, because if people want to say to me, uh, tone it down or whatever, um, but this is who I am, Black radical feminist who will speak straight. And that's just how I do, George. And you know this, we've known each other for years. Yes. Uh, but I want people to think I'm mistreating you or something. And that's what it ends up happening when the white people are in our meetings. They accuse me of mistreating you for mm -hmm. talking to you, frankly. And I don't want that to be the case with the black women in this team. Okay. Got you. All right, y'all. Many blessings. I'm putting this on my calendar. I'm pencil it 24th at 7. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Right. Dinner time.